Welcome to the Neurotech course. My name is Jennifer French and uh, thank you for attending this session. This is one of many modules in the entire course about learning how to translate and commercialize neurotechnologies. The entire series is supported by the National Institutes of Health Blueprint for Neuroscience Research. And today's topic is understanding the user perspective. So before we start getting into the details of the course, I do wanna highlight creative comments that are available for you. Uh, and, and they're here on slide two, um, their accessibility and their, their, their licensing and sharing agreements. But I won't go into these details, but the resource is here for you if you need them. Again, my name is Jennifer French. I'm the executive director of Neurotech Network. And our topic today is understanding the user perspective. Sometimes it's called patient engagement or consumer engagement, but we're gonna get into that today. So let's dig into those learning objectives. We have four of them today. And one of them, the first one of course, is to understand why the user perspective is important. Uh, and secondly, we're going to identify a couple of established models of engagement to see what fits best into your device therapy or treatment that you're developing. We're also going to assess who to engage along that development spectrum of your neurotechnology device therapy or treatment. And finally, we're going to close out the course with um, a couple of case examples and some access to resources for you to learn a little bit more after this session. When we start to think about neurotechnologies, we like to focus on the really cool features and the latest developments and how neat they really are. But neurotechnologies and medical devices in particular are very intimate technologies, meaning that some of them people are have implanted in their bodies or they use on a daily basis and they incorporate into their daily routines. And really these devices cover such a wide array of people living with neurological conditions and diseases. Everything from obsessive compulsive disorder to depression, to Alzheimer's disease, to multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson's disease, to chronic pain. There's a wide array of conditions, meaning that there's a wide array of people that could potentially be using your device therapy and treatment. And while they use these devices, they have different roles that they play. So a lot of times we focus in on the patient, but I want you to remember that the person that's using your device or therapy or treatment, they might be a patient when they're under a physician's care, when they walk into a facility or a clinic, or maybe for two hours when they come in for therapy in a facility. But once they walk out of that facility, they suddenly become a user of your device. So they're no longer under that patient care, but they're using that device and integrating it into their lives. Now they also play a different role as when they're looking at choosing a device, whether it's yours or someone else's or another therapy treatment along the clinical uh, treatment spectrum, they become a consumer. They have to make those types of choices of whether they're going to, to do a lifestyle change or a pharmaceutical, do a surgery, or, or, or in using one of your devices or therapies. So think about that, that they become a, a consumer of that device and an end user. But there's a lot of stakeholder roles. But the thing to also to understand is that they're adding value on the lived experience. And what I mean by the lived experience is that, you know, a clinician might see them for an hour or two or might check on them occasionally. But the people living with these neurological conditions are living with them 24 seven, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, day and night. And they have an intimate relationship with what it means to live with that condition. So they can add value to you as you're developing along the spectrum. So let's dig into some of the really key benefits of uh, gaining that user perspective. And I'd kind of like to put them into three buckets. So here we look first at your product profiles. So uh, not so much as when you're looking for a technology and trying to find a problem to solve. Really, we look at understanding the priorities and the preferences and, and what, what's really important to the people living with the condition that you're trying to target. Uh, so bringing in some meaningful priorities for them and building that into your product features and your product profiles, understanding what are the must-haves, the need-to-haves, and the really wow features. I'd love to use the example of um, 
the, the assumptions that people make when they see wheelchair users, particularly people with paralysis who are wheelchair users. Many people always assume that the first thing that they want is to be able to get out of their wheelchairs and walk, and that's their top priority. And that's an assumption that's made. But even for particularly the, the spinal cord injury community, when we started to look into the details and really dig into the, the preferences, their highest priority was solving bladder and bowel issues and addressing other chronic neuropathic pain. Those were their priorities over walking. So don't always assume that you know what the priorities are for your target population. Really dig into the data and understand why and, and talking to them and gaining their perspectives can help you build meaningful neurotechnology devices. The other bucket that we can throw this into is really understanding and the benefits that you can gain from input is understanding the clinical execution. So when you're going to design your clinical trial, we always try to think about integrating the end user when we're trying to recruit, but integrating them in the clinical design phase is really important because then you can see whether the protocols that you're putting forward are meaningful for them. Meaning, you know, what's the recovery time? How much, uh, how much time a day do they have to spend on that therapeutic treatment? Uh, how many times do they need to go into a clinic per week uh, or per month? Um, and what are those inclusion and exclusion criteria? So they can help you in building that design out um, and, and helping you to understand the community while you're doing that. Again, they can also, we always look at recruitment, so again, they can help you to spark interest within their community uh, uh, into your clinical trial. And again, that, that helps you with your endpoints of meeting your recruitment goals. And finally, it can help you in terms of reducing your dropout rates and the uh, protocol amendments, which can be costly and time consuming, which are two very valuable things when you're an, a, an entrepreneur or a startup company. So remember they, that, that end user input can help you along that perspective. And finally, for time to impact. Uh, again, gaining that perspective can help you accelerate your deployment when it comes to, to a market launch. Uh, but also with clinical adoption. So even though you might get a device approved, that's great, but if you don't get clinical adoption, you're not gonna be able to, to distribute or, or a put, put your product out there and get it out for heavy use. Another reason of why we should care, well, why it matters? Well, the regulators, it matters to them. The FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, and particularly the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, they put out some draft guidance uh, late in 2019 about what patient engagement actually is and what it means and how they define it. And actually they provided a very specific definition of engagement. And what they put forth is this, is that engagement is an intentional, meaningful interaction with patients that provide opportunities for mutual learning and effective collaboration. So let's pull apart that definition because there's really two key points in that definition. One is that it's a mutual learning experience meaning it's not just you talking about your technology to the people that have lived experience and helping them learn about your device and how you're developing it, but it's also you listening to them of what their lived experience is and how different types of features might work well for them or help solve the problem or really understanding the pain points that they might have that are really important to them. Also, another key point in this definition is that it's an effective collaboration, meaning that this is a partnership. It's a two-way conversation and a two-way communication, and that's an important part of that definition. Now, I tend to hear from researchers and scientists that say, well, I'm interacting with my end user population because I talk to the people who are in my clinical trial and uh, I talk to them so, so I, I understand their perspective. And the FDA says, well, wait a minute, there's actually two separate roles and they give you a definition for that. They define a person that's involved in your clinical trial and someone who is a consumer advisor very differently and this is how they define it. A subject or research participants are individuals who are or become a participant in research who either uh, are a recipient of a test article or a control. Simple enough, they are the participants in your clinical trial. But they give a very different definition to a consumer advisor, to somebody that's advising you along the way, and they define it this way. They are individuals who have expertise of living with a disease or a condition and serve in an advisory or consultative capacity to improve clinical investigation, design, and conduct, but who are not 
subjects or research participants themselves. So the way that the FDA is saying this is that they're very different roles and they're, they're different people should serve in those roles because you're going to get different perspectives from somebody that's participating in a clinical trial compared to somebody that is as being an advisor to you. Let's dig into some of the, the models uh, that are currently out there and how they might fit into the development spectrum. The first one we're going to look at is really digging into what's called patient preferences. And this model was uh, published really in the context of the development of neuroprosthesis, but it does fit nicely into other neurotechnologies as well. And um, the authors of this article were at the FDA at the time, and uh, they titled this Incorporating Patient Preferences into Medical Devices in the Total Product Life Cycle. That's such language of the FDA, the total product life cycle. But here's the thing about their model. They look at incorporating patient preferences even in the discovery and ideation stage. Again, it's not saying I have a cool technology, let me see where I can apply it. It's really digging in and understanding the problem and the target audience and the pain points that you're trying to solve and applying technologies to it so you can come up with a better solution. That also, starting off at that early stage, can help you along the spectrum to your prototype in building in those patient preferences into your, your design controls. And those design controls bleed directly into your first prototypes and your innovations uh, and, and help you design a device that meets the needs of the end user that you're trying to target. Moving along the spectrum, I always get the question of why should I involve the end user perspective in preclinical work? Well, it's important because of this, is because when you're looking at the tests that you're going to do in preclinical, you have to start thinking about how that is going to translate into a human clinical trial. So really getting the perspective of these are the tests that I'm going to do, am I testing or am I, am I studying the right thing to be able to move this in and be able to translate it into a human clinical trial. And of course, once we get into the human clinical trials, we already talked about recruitment and design, but also giving you an opportunity to listen to that lived experience, to have a better understanding of what risk versus benefit is. You don't ask that question when you're near the end of your clinical trial or just designing your clinical trial and ready to go to, to the regulators. You want to learn along the spectrum of what the risks versus benefit are so, so you have a good understanding by the time you go to the regulators. And then, of course, it becomes uh, important once you uh, go to um, get your approval and start to do your post-market surveillance and labeling. So this is just one model that's out there of how you can incorporate lived experience into the development spectrum. Another model uh, was uh, published by a, an organization called Faster Cures. They also take a very linear uh, approach and this model is actually published in their beginner's guide for understanding patient centricity. Uh, and what I like about this model is, again, it starts at the very early stages, looking at your pre-discovery work, understanding the problem that you're trying to solve, and then you're applying your technologies to it. But this model also puts out very pointed um, directives or activities or tasks that can be accomplished along the development spectrum and how that end user input is, can be meaningful along there. But a few things I want to point out is that uh, look at some of these different stages and not just at one stage, but the, the lived experience can help you in recruitment, can help you in funding. Um, of course, they're not going to write the grants for you, but they can help you to put in the right language and be a possibly find some alternative areas for funding. Also, when it comes to patient ref uh, uh, registries um, and really interacting with the community where you're trying to uh, rec recruit for phase one, phase two, or phase three studies. Also, um, this model points out the power of advocacy that the end user or that that lived experience can play for you at the later stages of development, both when they go to uh, FDA or other regulators and also in your post-market surveillance. Another thing about this model that I like as well is, is um, it, it talks about the tasks and it key, keys out the tasks of uh, getting gaining feedback along the spectrum and helping you to interpret the data that you're receiving. So I'm not saying that that 
they're going to be a statistician, but what they will do is they'll look at the data points that you've, you've been able to capture and be able to translate that for you into real world experience. So what do the outcomes that you're collecting, what does that mean to real world experience and being able to translate that and understanding the language of the community that you're trying to serve? One other model that's published out there from the University of British Columbia takes a very different approach. This is the IKT or the Integrated Knowledge Transfer Model, and they look at the development spectrum in a circular way. They look at it in terms of an iterative process of the development of devices, therapies, and treatments. And they have the same stages as the linear approach does, but what they say is, they need to, that incorporating that end user experience along the entire spectrum and helps you with that iterative process and really helps you in the, the understanding what are uh, the key points that you need to include in your generation one and what are some of the features you might be able to hold off for generation two and three and so on. Also in pointing out what are some of the, the endpoints um, and the outcome measures that can be meaningful uh, for you and also are you addressing the right research question when you're uh, approaching uh, the, the early stages of the development of your device? The IKT model also uh, gives us some guiding principles. So these are eight guiding principles that are published uh, within this same um, manuscript. And I'm not gonna go into each one of these principles very specifically, but I wanna point out some key points to you. One is that each one of these pr principles addresses the relationship between you and um, the end user community, the lived experience community as a partnership. It's a relationship, uh, very much similar to the way that the FDA put in the, de the definition of engagement, meaning that it's, a, that it's an effective and collaboration. Again, the, the guiding principles put it out as a partnership. Also key in these principles is that understanding that it's a joint effort of trust, respect, and honest communication. So it's you communicating honestly to um, your, your end, uh, end user or lived experience uh, advisors, but also them communicating to you as well and building that into your program. I also wanna point out two key principles. One is, is five and six. So five points out that um, the partners are flexible and receptive to tailoring research approaches to match um, the aims and context of the project, meaning that we might have to change some of your project uh, stages or guidelines that you're looking for uh, as you learn along the process. Uh, and, and the same for the design and the, and the, the engagement that you might need along that spectrum. So understanding that we need to be flexible can't be marked in stone. Also six points out that, that it's a meaningful benefit for participating in the partnership. So it's not just uh, bringing somebody in to be a token of, of saying, okay, I, I talked to somebody in the community, meaning that it's a partnership between the two and it's a, it's a, 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 a relationship that you have over a period of time in the development of your device. And finally, the key thing to point out are ethical considerations. So when you're looking at building in protocols and labeling um, and, and uh, uh, the language that you might put into your recruitment parameters uh, or your recruitment materials, understand the ethical concerns that, that you should consider. So those are the, the three models that are available and how they might fit into uh, your your program or the development of your device therapy and treatment. Now let's dig into a little bit about choosing your partners. So how do you choose your partners? Here's some best practices that are available from MDIC, the Medical Device Innovation Consortium, that they put out, which I think can be really pointed and, and helpful for you as a neurotechnology developer and entrepreneur. First, you want to assess the target groups um, and understanding the expertise that they have, the assets that they can have, and the value that they can add to your program. So really picking out the right group of people, whether it's diversity, whether it's um, a locale, uh, whether it's the type of condition, whether it's the stage of the condition that they have. So really kind of pinpointing those details. Also, matching the lived experience group expertise to the specific needs of your program. So what that means is that it might change along the spectrum, and I'm gonna go into that uh, a little bit of, 
what are the groups and maybe you have a team of people and you engage them in different space phases of your development and in different aspects also in choosing your partners you want to ensure that the groups um, are essential partners and they're not token voices so again i mentioned token tokenism earlier in the guiding principles but really uh, so many times we might see a funding agency require um, that you have a consumer advisor or maybe a team of consumer advisors um, in your grant proposal. It's not a matter of putting a name there, but actually building in that voice and, and having a meaningful engagement with them uh, throughout the development spectrum. Also, you want to build in clear lines of communication to facilitate that collaboration. So establishing what the communication is going to be, whether you're going to set up monthly meetings, quarterly meetings, uh, biannual meetings, or if they're going to be ad hoc along the way, but make sure that you fit up a schedule and have, have an idea of what that communication is going to be and how you're going to communicate um, along, uh, the, well, along your, your development pathway. Also, you want to be able to measure uh, the, the impact. A lot of the in the room are, are a lot of people watching this are engineers, so you want to be able to measure and measure whether your engagement is meaningful. So make sure that you do a reflection along the way to make sure that, that uh, the engagement that you have is meaningful and having an impact for you. And finally, establish an ongoing relationship and communication on a regular basis. Now, I mentioned that earlier, of establishing meetings or, or establishing how you're going to be communicating with them. So put, build that into how you are going to choose your right partners and making sure that they want to be engaged in your program just as much as you want them to be engaged. So when we think about levels of engagement, there's a whole array of engagement uh, programs that you can have, everything from a consumer advisory board to a community survey and everything in between. And there's lots of options for you. Uh, this is just one example of uh, the levels or different levels of engagement and the progression uh, that that you can can use to get to your end point. So this example was a partnership with the FDA and the Michael J. Fox Foundation to better understand the Parkinson's disease population. And they really wanted to get to a community survey. But this is a nice example of how they progressed to get to their final community survey. So uh, what they did is they uh, pulled together uh, several working groups of people with lived experience and started to put a lot of ideas against the wall. So these working groups uh, and guided with uh, the development team to be able to hone in on what, what are the key aspects, what are the key uh, important uh, priorities for the population that they were trying to target. Then after they had all of these ideas and working uh, with different groups, they had a prioritization session. So they took smaller groups, took all of those ideas and started to rank them in terms of importance, not only from a development team perspective, but also from the target population perspective. And they took those rankings and then held three one-hour discussion groups with their the target population, the people with lived experience, to really hone in on those priorities and what type of language they need to use in terms of a discussion instrument or a, a query instrument instrument for their community survey. So once they had that instrument, then they used it in in-depth interviews with key people with lived experience to make sure that they had the language correct and they were getting the responses uh, that they were looking for to make sure that they had the right wording on those questions and whether the flow was uh, correct uh, um, and in terms of the survey instrument. And then once they honed in on that and, and really perfected the instrument, then they went out to a community survey uh, and, and had uh, um, almost 3,000 responses in their survey. So again, this is a really nice example of to be the ability to progress to get to an end mm -hmm. instrument, but how they did that in involving the lived experience in the process. So this is one example, but it really gives you a couple of ideas that you can use for your engagement program. 
So when we think about uh, recruiting people, there's a lot of questions that, it, that you can ask and this is a good guide to put you in the right direction. So when you're trying to, uh, you've got your target population and now you need to recruit people from that target, target population, here are some basic questions that you should be able to answer uh, when you go out for, rec for recruiting people within, uh, with lived experience. So first of all, describe your project. Be very brief. You don't need to write a book about it, but be able to keep it uh, brief and in very lay language. So a lot of a, a really good uh, exercise is to be able to, to write a few paragraphs about the description of what you're trying to achieve and give it to someone that has no technical background to make sure that it's in, in lay language so people can understand what, what you're we are uh, trying to achieve with the development of your device. Also, describe who you're seeking. So not just people who are living with a specific condition, but is there an age group? Is there a, a point to the progression of their, their condition that you're seeking? Uh, what about geography? Do you want, are you looking for people that are living in an urban or a rural environment? Uh, whether people are tech savvy or not. So there's a lot of demographics, but here you want to lay them out of, of what you're, you're looking for. Um, and also be mindful of diversity when you're asking those types of questions. Also, uh, what are the duties and responsibilities? What are the things that you're trying to achieve? So are you asking for someone to join a consumer advisory board um, and, and uh, what you're expecting out of them in terms of feedback? Is it a matter of being part of a focus group or, uh, or just a, a response to a, to a survey? Also include what time commitments you're expecting out of, out of uh, the people that you are recruiting. Are you planning on monthly meetings, quarterly meetings? Is this a one-time uh, meeting that you're expecting? And the duration of those meetings, are they one hour, two hours? Is it going to be you know, a half-day session? What, do you, what time commitment are you expecting out of them? Also, what is the duration of that commitment? Is this a one-time thing? Is it going to be a one-year commitment, a five-year commitment? so people have an idea of, of what they're signing up for. Also, what type of technology uh, they might need to be involved and uh, are there transportation issues? So are you expecting in-person meetings and when might, that, uh, when might they occur and, and how far do people need to travel? And if that travel is covered by you or is it something that they would have to pay, pay out of pocket? Also, are you going to be meeting over video conferences? And if you if you are, what type of platform that would be? Um, are you expecting them to have high-speed internet access? Are they going to need computer access or access to specific software so you can share documents? Um, or, and if they're able to use uh, a smartphone, a tablet, or will they need a computer? And finally, what compensation uh, that, that you're offering? So just as you would hire a statistician or a CRO or any other consultant into your program, think of consumer advisors as a consultant for your program. So what, what compens how are you gonna compensate them for their time? And also you can be creative. So compensation doesn't always need to be monetary. So, so you can always be creative when it comes to compensation. So this is just a quick guide on what questions you should uh, answer or address when you're looking at recruiting people for your engagement program. So let's review our takeaways from today. So today we distinguish the value of a research participant and a consumer advisor with lived experience and the differences between those two. We uh, talked a little bit about integrating the lived experience in all of the areas of device development and gave you three different models that you might use to integrate into your program. Thirdly, we established a meaningful and ongoing engagement along the spectrum of development and talked about guiding principles, um, what are some of the best practices out there, questions you can ask for recruitment, and types of engagement that you can have. And finally, um, really talked about adhering to those guiding and respective principles uh, from the IKT model. But before we go, uh, we wanted to have a little take some takeaways for you to learn a little bit more about consumer engagement, 
and uh, gaining the user perspective into the design of your devices. So a lot of uh, references that we had today, they're available here on the webpage um, where you found this video. And I'll go over just a few of them to introduce them to you. So first is uh, from MDIC, the Medical Device uh, Innovation Consortium. Their best practices for communicating benefits, risks, and uncertainty for medical devices. Those are the best practices that I referred to earlier. They have a whole uh, publication on this uh, and the link is available here on this page. Also on this page is the uh, Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative. Now, this is something that was developed out of the pharmaceutical industry, but many of the principles within this initiative can bleed over very easily to the uh, medical device development spectrum. So it's a great resource for you with some really wonderful toolkits. Also, um, early on in this session, we referenced the FDA, CDRH, um, and the CBER, CBER, uh, their uh, guidance. Uh, that we referenced about patient engagement and uh, the link is available here on this page so you can go to uh, the, those draft guidance directly. Another program that was developed out of the pharmaceutical industry is a nonprofit called Transcellurate, and they offer a patient protocol engagement toolkit. Now again, this was developed uh, from the pharmaceutical industry, but there's a lot of principles that you can use in the medical device development as well. So they have a toolkit and that link is here. Finally, uh, the National Health Council has a whole slew of resources about patient engagement, everything from another, a different type of toolkit to compensation cal uh, calculators to uh, different levels of engagement and different types of engagement that you can use. So it's a great resource for you as well and the link is available on this page. We're also offering as a supplement to this course two case examples of neurotechnology uh, companies and, uh, and understanding the lived experience and lived experience interviews. So we offer uh, the company brief uh, overview. So there's going to be a write-up about the company so you can get familiar with them and then also a video interview with one of their users of their devices. Uh, devices. And uh, the two companies that we profiled here are um, Saluda Medical which has developed a closed loop spinal cord stimulation system uh, for chronic pain. Uh, and also uh, Cala Health, which uh, is a neuromodulation company that's developed a non-invasive peripheral nerve stimulation with their first indication of essential tremor. So hopefully it can take a lot more takeaways than just from this video, but all these links can give you some resources as well. Thank you for attending this course. We appreciate you learning about integrating the user perspective and we hope you put this into the development of your device therapy or treatment.